My topic is the future of IntelliJer. And, um, you know, obviously I don't know the future of IntelliJer, so, you know, um, I will treat the whole talk as a little bit of a tongue in cheek, maybe um, trying to create some interesting thoughts in, in your minds. And hopefully, you know, I would say this talk is only a success if you disagree with at least one thing that I say. So that's kind of my goal. In terms of the flow of the talk, I want to first talk a little bit about uh, why are we all in excited about IntelliJ? So I actually um, went did a little bit of walking around asking people, um, you know, why are you specifically interested in IntelliJ and why are you excited? And I compiled some of the answers and, and want to talk about that. And then um, I have some thoughts on like what should our strategy be? And please keep in mind these are just my personal thoughts, so you um, please disagree. Um, if, if, you, if you have a good reason to. And um, then uh, there's sort of a call to action to build on IntelliJer. And I think one of the things I've taken away from conversations uh, with people here and also in the past is that oftentimes uh, people out there aren't as clear on like what building on IntelliJer means, what that looks like, what the architecture should be, what are best practices. And obviously I can't cover all of that, but I do want to give some thoughts on, you know, if, if I had infinite time, you know, what would I do? And, and you know, maybe there's some useful tidbits for you. And then finally, um, this is just a kind of a guess of what might be the timeline for IntelliJer. Um, and again, this is just a guess, you know, so we'll see what actually happens. So first of all, let's talk about, you know, what, what people said about why they're excited about IntelliJer. So one of the common answers was that you're sort of changing the rules. Um, and this is a not a direct quote, but a rough quote from one of the respondents, which I like, which is um, you're kind of changing the laws of physics. And I think what a lot of people highlighted there is um, not so much just that, oh, we're writing some spec that a lot of people are going to implement, but we are actually enabling the exchange of value on the internet. Um, and that changes the dynamics. It changes the game theory of, you know, how do you build a website or how do you build a distributed network or any of those kinds of things. And so a lot of people are excited about that. Another thing I heard, and this actually is funny because I, I put this in the presentation and then I think, um, I forgot who, but one of the speakers brought it up as well. And I was like, great, yeah, like, you know, this is coherent. And so it's sort of the idea of re erasing boundaries. Um, so whereas previously um, you had national payment systems and national payment processors and people in Africa use mobile money and that is just completely incompatible with, you know, the um, the, the PayPal that might be used in the US, IntelliJer can kind of erase a lot of those boundaries and people are excited about that possibility. Um, another thing that was very common is it is simple or um, people would call it pragmatic. Um, and I think this is something that I hear especially from people from, with a blockchain background um, or other sort of highly technical backgrounds. And I think it comes from the fact that, you know, we're, you know this was an explicit design goal. And, um, uh, I don't know if we've achieved it yet, <laughs> but we've definitely made some, some real progress towards it. And so this is very rewarding and, and validating to hear that people actually appreciate the uh, simplicity to the extent that, it, that it's simple. Another one is this idea that software is paying software. Um, so whereas traditional payments might be, you know, I log into a, a wallet and, and I, or check out on a, on a merchant website, um, IntelliJer, because the transactions can be much smaller, enables a lot of use cases with more automation. Um, and that kind of opens up a whole new world of, of business models and business processes that might not have been possible before. And this is a more of a direct quote. <laughs> um, and I included it just because I thought it was funny because, and also because working at Ripple for a long time, I had a lot of interactions with the payment industry. And um, this is how a lot of people in the payment industry feel. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's fairly representative. Um, and it's also part of what gets me personally excited about IntelliJer. It's kind of, you know, I, I often tell the story, and I apologize if you've heard it already, but um, when I was working at a web agency in London, uh, we were three full-time employees, and then we had a bunch of freelancers. Um, and the freelancers were kind of all over the world. And in one particular case, we actually had to, um, we, we could not work with, with somebody in Pakistan because we couldn't find a way to pay them. And I just remember thinking, that is effing stupid, and that needs to be fixed ASAP. And so, you know, what, we're all excited about it, but what is it actually that, that causes these nice benefits? And, and at the root of it, what, is, is what makes IntelliJer an awesome, powerful idea and, and, and technology? You have to be humble here because we're actually just copying or emulating an existing idea, which is, uh, packet switching, and this idea goes back all the way to the 60s, and it's, it's essentially the 
academic underpinning of the internet, the idea that if I want to um, send some data from, from one person to another, um, I can just split the data into um, sort of standard sized packets and I can send them across different paths and then they will get to the recipient and they will reassemble it. That is sort of something that people have been thinking about all the way back then. And what we're essentially saying is like, this is a really cool thing that works amazingly well for communication. So could we just apply it to, to money? And when, when you think about it in retrospect, it's like it seems really obvious. And so it's really strange that hasn't already happened. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm very interested if anyone can find like, references to other attempts to apply packet switching to money. But uh, I couldn't find anything like that. So very curious if anyone knows anything in that respect. So essentially, Interledger, instead of routing packets of data, can route packets of money. Um, another thing that's interesting about that is that this was actually a fairly late introduction in the process of designing Intelligent. And I kind of think back as like, maybe I'm wrong about it being the core thing if it was such a recent ed addition. Um, but I think that a lot of the things that, that, we, that Intelligent enables ultimately come back to this one principle. Like, I think that what we were previously working on wouldn't have actually been something we could have implemented in practice without this idea. This idea is sort of the thing that makes it all work. We've already sent like 5.9 billion payments as COIL. And obviously we have a pretty small number of users. We have about 1,000 users. Basically, you know, that's, that's, that's a pretty big number for such a small number of users. And I think what's interesting here is not that we've sent so many payments, but rather the, the payments per user is very high. So if we look at you know, how many payments per user does Visa send in a year. Um, I, I did the math based on their 2018 annual report, and it's about 36 transactions on average. So they have 3.3 billion cardholders, and I think it was 124 billion transactions. So it works out to round about there. And um, uh, if you paid attention, you can actually do the math in your head of how many transactions per user uh, we did with Interledger, and that is about 5.9 million, okay? And so this is not like, a, like a, oh, we're making payments like 20% cheaper or something like that. This is like going from a fax machine to the internet, you know? And so it's a certain kind of profoundness to that. And that really makes you think about what the use cases could be and, and how different it actually could be from, from what we do today. And, and one of the things that, that I personally get excited about with Intelledger is that now, having been involved in the community for a while, having thought about these concepts for a while, I literally cannot imagine a future where penny switching is not a thing. Or like this, this the term might not be, by the way, I'm the only one using it, but, uh, <laughs> but um, the, the concept, I cannot imagine a future where that's not a thing. There could be another standard, right? There could be another group that comes out um, maybe with an even simpler standard or with one that's easier to adopt, but I can't imagine that, that the concept would not take off. And so it's kind of encouraging uh, in some ways, but also it raises a question of like, what can we actually do to help or like, what should, should we be doing with our time, which is limited. So I have a few thoughts on that. You know, I kind of started with, with this slide and I said like, well, we should, you know, work on things like secure routing. And, and then I quickly decided, no, no, that's, I'm totally approaching this the wrong way. And let me explain what I mean. There's a couple of pieces to it. The first thing is I remember reading about an interview with Vince Cerf. Um, where he was basically asked, like, why the hell did you limit the IP address space with, with such a low limit? Which, I mean, it's like four billion. It's not exactly a low, low limit, but, you know, it's a, you know we ran out. And what he said was, well, it was supposed to be an, an internal test. It was supposed to be something that we were just testing. Um, and by the time that we were like, okay, this is, you know, people are starting to use it. We should, you know, change it. It was like too annoying to change and too much work to change. So they were just like, okay, fine, we'll keep it. It'll probably be okay. Um, and so I, I started thinking about like, what does it take for something to escape the lab? You know, like how do we get from, hey, we're doing experiments with, with Intelligent, and it's really cool, and we're doing research, and, and we're writing specs, and it's great, but how do we actually get it to get out into the real world and, and escape the lab? And so, um, well, when you talk about Intelligent and like, you know, what benefits it has, the, the word we always use is interoperability. And when you say interoperability to people like blockchain the world, there's a huge, it's a huge buzzword right now. And when you say interoperability, what people kind of envision is something like this. And, and this is actually a picture that's taken like right here. Um, and uh, it's uh, something like an adapter, right? Like I have my thing, you have your thing. And 
something that provides interoperability is something that can connect the two things together, right? So like, like this adapter, you can make your um, you know, American, uh, inferior American devices plug into the superior UK uh, safe plugs and, uh, and it'll just work, right? Unless, you know, of course it's a, a device that doesn't handle the higher voltage and then it'll just blow up, but um, <laughs> most of the time it'll work. So, you know, that's what people envision with interoperability and if I apply this idea to Intel Edger, I get something like this. Right? It's like I have my Bitcoin application and I have Bitcoin and then some magical things happen and I can suddenly interact with like an Ethereum application, like an Ethereum wallet. Um, or maybe I can buy a crypto kitty with, with Bitcoin, right? Um, but that's unfortunately not something that IntelliJ can do at all, right? And so I think every time I, I've gone out and talked to people about how IntelliJ provides interoperability, I've been lying or at least over promising a little bit what it can actually do. Um, and so I so think about like, maybe we need to reframe a little bit uh, what IntelliJ is and, and what it actually provides. And, and by the way, I'm not including anyone else in this criticism. Maybe you've been smarter than me and explain it better, but uh, I've definitely made that mistake. And so I think this is a much more accurate picture of, of IntelliJ, which is it is an abstraction layer, right? There could be Bitcoin and Ethereum underneath, but at the end of the day, it's, it's something that you specifically write your application for, right? It's no longer a Bitcoin application. It's no longer an Ethereum application, it's an IntelliJ application. You know, the same way that, um, you know, you would write an, an application on top of TCP IP and at this point it's no longer an Ethernet application. That means we have to actually sell people on this idea that they should build on this platform and not another one, right? Um, and you can do the adapter thing to some extent. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the sort of, maybe the demo from Switch was sort of the, the best you can do. Um, as an adapter where it's like there's a sort of an onboarding onto IntelliJ, then you do something and then there's an offboarding. Um, but really the, the really nice IntelliJ future that we all want to get to is, is more this, where it's like actually people are building their apps with IntelliJ and so these things magically become interoperable. And um, I think some of the demos over the course of the, the conference have illustrated this principle where like I can very easily imagine the payment pointer that I saw in the GitHub demo could make its way into, you know, uh, one of the use case demos and suddenly I'm receiving money into my GitHub account. And so I can definitely see that happening, but that's, that's different than saying it's an interoperability protocol. And so if we want to drive IntelliJ adoption, I want to argue, perhaps controversially, but I want to argue that the necessary and sufficient um, work is to get people excited about building applications on IntelliJ. Like, why would you build an application for Ethernet? That is dumb, because Ethernet, you can only use it on one instance. You can't um, easily upgrade to a better network standard. You're gonna have to rewrite your whole application and, and its interfaces. Um, you can't have somebody that uses Ethernet interact with someone who uses Wi-Fi. Nobody would do that, it, it's freaking dumb. So don't do it. Um, please just build on IntelliJ, right? Um, and so that is a message that has to somehow get out, and it has to be, something that everyone immediately recognizes and says like, hey, if I'm building an application, obviously I'm gonna build it on IntelliJ because I don't wanna get stuck with some old version of Ethereum or I don't wanna get stuck with you know, some, some old ACH standard or PayPal, proprietary PayPal API or whatever. I want something that constantly involves and gets better and so I'm just gonna use IntelliJ. Um, and I think that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't write specs and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't write awesome tools and great documentation. I think those things are all what makes that possible um, but I think it's always good to be driven by a use case. I think that um, having worked on Coil a bunch really, really focused my thinking, our thinking as a team in terms of like what's needed and what isn't. And I think unless there is sort of a, um, a strong set of use cases and, and companies building use cases driving it, uh, we can easily get down into various rat holes that later we discovered didn't even matter. And so one of those rat holes, um, again, I'm trying to be controversial, so um, if you hate me, that's working. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things I notice people are doing is like, let's, let's try to get really good Bitcoin integration or let's try to get really good Ethereum integration. It's like, yeah, well, you know, if you want to build the world's fastest network, maybe making sure that mules are part of it is not your top priority, right? <laughs> it's like, maybe you should build some really cool apps such that the best ledgers out there will make their top priority being super compatible with IntelliJ, right? Um, maybe it should be, your priority should be to sort of create that, that goal and then have the fastest ledger go chase it and, and try to be 
better at um, uh, settling into ledger packets than anyone else. And that's, that's kind of a, um, something to think about. Another thing that I think will be controversial is um, a lot of people have talked about, oh, let's get 1,000 nodes, I think is, is an official goal for spring. And again, sorry for disagreeing, but um, <laughs> I think one of the things that I've learned about, for, especially from my time being in blockchain, is that decentralization is, is a genetic thing. Um, it's not entirely, but it, I, I think it's mostly true. Um, and what I mean by that is there's something pretty inherent in a, in a project which could be driven by the actual specifications, the, the actual technology, um, or it could be more driven by um, how people talk about it or what the culture and values of that project are. But at the end of the day, it's pretty immutable, right? Um, for example, in the Bitcoin project, I remember there was a day when, when somebody realized, oh, oops, um, Deepit, one of the Bitcoin mining pools, has more than 51% hash power. Whoops. Um, so that means like Bitcoin right now is not technically decentralized. Um, but that was fixed very quickly by Deepit also realizing that and, and racking up uh, and, and increasing their fees to kind of get people off of their pool and, and spread it out a bit more because they realized that that was kind of antithetical to the whole project. And so, you know, another example would be when uh, XRP Ledger first launched, um, Ripple ran all the validators. Um, and for a long time, we got like, har like perhaps justifiably criticized for that. Um, but nowadays, like Ripple only runs one quarter of the validators, so it no longer has um, a majority. And um, I think that, uh, first of all, that process will continue. And second of all, I think that was pretty inevitable because of the way that the network is architected. It can run as a distributed network, and the algorithms are designed for that. Um, and Ripple always talked about it as a distributed network. And so I was never concerned, even as, as CTO, I was never concerned that that wouldn't happen or that we wouldn't get there. I was much more concerned about real world usage and adoption um, that would justify some of the costs involved in running a distributed network and maintaining it. Um, and, and as a Bitcoin contributor, I, I knew that cost very well. It's a lot of work that goes into a project like that. Um, and so applying this to Interledger, I think I'm not concerned if there's only one connector. In fact, I'm more concerned that is that connector making enough money to make it a sustainable business? Um, and so before I want to add a second connector, I want to make sure that there is enough money and traffic and volume to sustain two connectors um, before I try to get somebody else to start a company um, to make another connector. What, is, what do you mean by genetic? It's, it's something that can't change. It's something that no matter how much you, you change on the outside, the core of it will either always be decentralized or not. And it's not a perfect truism. It's, it's not um, always true. It could change. But I think people overestimate the um, importance of the current state of centralization or decentralization. Okay, so here's a, sort of a series of, of thoughts on how to build an interledger. And I'm using all blockchain use cases. Um, that's coincidental, that's not necessarily by design, but um, having spent a lot of time in the blockchain industry, I, I happen to know those use cases a little bit better and those architectures. And, and maybe there's also a lot of blockchain, uh, people with blockchain background in the audience. So maybe this will resonate, um, but we'll see. So for example, um, one of the earlier um, blockchain projects um, was a Namecoin. And what Namecoin tried to do is uh, basically create an alternative to the domain name system and other namespace uh, databases. And so the idea is that, well, you have this, this blockchain and uh, you know, there's the actual blockchain part, the thing that keeps the state, and then there's their token, and then you build some kind of namespace app into the into this system. And what was interesting to me is like there's this interdependency across uh, layers, which is in order for the blockchain to not get spammed and, and um, immediately suffer denial of service attacks, you have to introduce fees. But in order to introduce fees, you need people to have some token which they can pay those fees. And then, of course, in order to have a token, you need to have a database you can store the balances for that token in. And so those two things kind of depend on each other. And then once you have that thing, then you can build a namespace on top. Um, but then when somebody else wants to build a different application, they have to kind of replicate that. Um, they have to build their own blockchain. And this is how we ended up with you know, thousands of tokens. And one thing that's interesting to me about that is like, well, if I go to buy clothes, I don't really use like a clothing token. You know, I just use dollars. Um, and I think that that's because every time you go from one token to another, there's a necessary cost involved in that. So, you know, you have to pay an exchange rate essentially. And so you can have a more efficient economy if, if more people use the same tokens. And I think what will probably happen is that tokens will be more generic. It'll be 
you know, hey, I'm using you know, a, a digital token or I'm using a fiat currency, not so much I'm using a specific token that's only used for you know, name uh, purchasing. So how would we re-architect this with IntelliJ? Well, what, in, what does IntelliJ give us? Well, it gives us this, this really nice primitive called stream, which can send data and money from one person to the other. Um, and so if we have that primitive, well, we don't need to introduce a new token. We can just say like, well, if I want to pay you, I will send you money over IntelliJ. And uh, of course, when I made this presentation, I didn't realize that we would already have like an example of such a network being presented. So um, if I wanted to kind of draw up a rough architecture, I would say like, well, you'd have this sort of base layer where um, you, you can move money around. And then Codius, um, the name I think has appeared before, but I want to explain briefly what it is. Codius is essentially just a system where you have uh, people running servers and other people paying to run software on those servers. And um, it, it itself it doesn't keep any state or anything. It just uses IntelliJ to pay for the hosting costs, essentially. Um, another way of looking at it is like it's an AWS where you pay with IntelliJ and anyone can be a host. Um, and I just put that in there as you know, a possible layer. You could make another different system that, that essentially solves the same problem. And then on top of that, well, you would probably still want some kind of ledger because in order to keep your namespace, you need some kind of state. And you probably don't want to um, re-implement the primitives for keeping state in general every time for every use case. So I kind of said, like, that's probably sort of a reusable module. And then we can build our namespace on top of that. And so why is that better than making a blockchain and, and a token and all that? Well, so I kind of already said, like, you know, there's a friction in having lots of tokens, but that's kind of a minor thing. Maybe we could work around that with really efficient exchanges. Um, another thing that I think is a very big practical hurdle is that establishing a token is very expensive. You have to have a business development team that talks to a bunch of exchanges, tries to get it listed. A lot of exchanges now charge you to get a token listed um, or ask you to do a big airdrop or something like that. It's a lot of work. Um, and of course, your token has to be hosted somewhere, and that's a whole software project. And so at a minimum, you're saving yourself, I would say, 50% or more of the total engineering effort by building an IntelliJ instead of creating a token. But there's also some like, actual benefits when you're done. You know, once you've done all the work in either case, um, doing it on top of IntelliJ gives you some benefits. And you know, this is uh, some slides from an old Codius presentation, but you know, it kind of illustrates the flexibility that building on a non-blockchain sort of hosting platform gives you. And that is, you can more freely choose what the security um, properties of your system are. And, and there's a lot of projects now like Cosmos and, and, and others that realize this and, and are building this direction. Where like, okay, let's say I, I wanna have 10 hosts and I want them to be you know, recognized hosting companies or I want them to be anonymous or I want them to be um, globally distributed. I can ex actually just choose Codius hosts that meet those criteria. Um, and have whatever governance process I want for updating that list. Or if I want to have a different kind of system where I want just as many hosts as possible, it doesn't matter if they're secure or not. Um, this could be a distributed computing or it could be a content delivery network where I just care about what's the latency to get the content from the closest node to you. Um, I could use all the hosts or, or a large number that, that fits my quality criteria. Or maybe um, latency is really important, but um, the, the quality of the host is also important and I want to have sort of um, regional blockchains, and this could be something where like, hey, I want some my transactions to clear in milliseconds instead of in, in seconds, and so I have a US blockchain, I have a European blockchain, I have an Asian blockchain, um, and they each can come to consensus more quickly, and then maybe I use some interoperability tool like IBC or Interledger to go in between. Um, or maybe I'm literally just, you know, wanting to run like a, a trusted, a, a system where you don't have to trust me, and I just upload a single uh, I'll just upload my code to a single host for something like I'm betting with a friend or something like that where it's not exactly um, I have to worry about nation state attackers and things like that. And just to explain, like, you can apply the same like, re-architecture principles to a lot of different things that are currently like, per being pursued as blockchain projects. And one, another example is like, if you wanted to re-architect Filecoin, it's like Filecoin is another thing, it's like a, a ledger and a token. Um, and they kind of feed each other, and then you have file hosts, and really what you need is just, you know, you have file hosts and they're being paid by IntelliJ, and that's, as far as I can tell, solves a lot of the same problems. Now, there's still other things like discovery and so on, but um, I, just, I just like the contrast of, like, it is a lot simpler to just pay people with some existing infrastructure. It's like saying, it's like the difference between 
saying, I want to make a new communications network, so let's get out some shovels and lay down some fiber versus just, we're going to build on TCP IP. Right? Here's another example is, let's say I want to issue a token, and that, that's literally the goal. It's not that I want to use the token for some other use case, but it's actually I, the token is the goal. Um, so an example of that would be like ERC-20 on, on Ethereum or um, Stellar or XRP Ledger all have functionality for that. And so um, I still need some kind of native token to operate the database and, and the same sort of bottom layer still exists. And so I have to do all the same work that we talked about before. Um, I, I need once again a, a ledger. Um, you might recognize this module as something that we've talked about before when we were building the name coin thing. Um, and then we need to actually be able to issue the tokens on that. And of course I can once again re-architect this, and as you can see, this is the exact same stack as Namecoin. And when I say stack, uh, same stack, it's not just that I can fork Namecoin and only change the bit that I, I, I want to do differently, but I can use the same exact resources, right? I can use the same wallets, I can use the same hosts, I can use the same um, ledger instances if I want um, and host my, my, my tokens on that. And of course, this is a huge amount to build, but once it's built, it's much more reusable um, as an infrastructure, and there's much more, there will be much better utilization because you have multiple different use cases overlapping in terms of the utilization of these shared resources, right? Um, if I want to get more adoption and exchanges, I no longer have to do that myself. Other people are running around getting into ledger compatible blockchains accepted at exchanges. In fact, maybe I don't even need the exchanges as much because there are actual fiat wallets directly on Interledger, and I can tap into those. Um, by the way, that's something that uh, was sort of an aha moment for me was um, I was talking to um, some, uh, some creators that are thinking about using our platform and I was asking them, kind of trying to find out if, if how much value there is in, in adding Ethereum and Bitcoin payout support. And the answer I got was um, interesting because they said, um, well, you already support crypto. And I'm like, yeah, 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 but you know, we only support XRP right now, like there's no Bitcoin and Ethereum wallets. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but it's crypto, right? And I was like, well, but it's different crypto. And like, basically what came out was like, if you're not part of the crypto world, then your decision is pretty much between your local currency or like the closest thing you can get. Like for instance, if your currency is not supported, then maybe use dollars or euros or something that you can convert. Um, and, and crypto. And the reason is because there's a lot of overlap between the different cryptos that an exchange supports. So like it, most places that, that take Bitcoin also take Ethereum and XRP and you can use those same places to convert it. And then the volatility is also very highly correlated. So like, you know, when Bitcoin is up, very often Ethereum and XRP will be up too, and vice versa. And so for a mainstream user, they may want crypto. It's not that they, don't, they aren't interested in it, and they don't want to play around with it and try it. Um, so they do appreciate that as a feature, but they don't necessarily care which one it is. Um, and so that made me definitely um, spend a lot less time thinking about how to add more cryptos kind of to go back to this sort of mule point, um, getting those cryptos on board it, as opposed to just saying like, hey, let's make better apps and then see which cryptos are stepping up to, to support Interledger and, and, and get a piece of that pie. So talking about the timeline, and I will apologize because there are probably people in this room that know this history much better than I do, but I, I tried to do some Googling and tried to put together sort of a rough timeline of how did the internet go from concept to, you know, I have a device in my pocket right now and probably all of you have, you know? And so, um, you know, the 60s, packet switching is generally considered to have been discovered. Um, and then the first sort of larger implementation or more serious implementation was ARPANET. Um, and they launched with sort of four universities as part of the network. Um, in 1974, the TCP specification was published. Um, and it's very hard to say, like, when was the actual internet launched? Um, but I sort of somewhat arbitrarily, but I chose the moment when BGP was replacing EGP. And the reason is because that's when you went from a fairly centralized routing architecture to a more decentralized routing architecture. Um, and, and, you know, there were still centralized aspects, but I think that's a pretty important, you know, move and change. And then um, I found that in the late 1980s was when you started to see more like commercial ISPs and sort of commercial usage of the internet. Um, and the rest, I think we all know, is like in the 90s, you started to have these like bigger tech companies, uh, and nowadays it, it sort of pervades daily life. Does anybody want to guess where we are with IntelliJ? Who thinks that we're um, <laughs> past the concept stage into the prototype stage or further? Oops, sorry. This should be most people, I think. I think we're past prototype. Okay, 
Um, who thinks we're past specification? Or we were at specification or later? Okay. Who thinks that we're at launch or later? Okay, starting to get more controversial. Who thinks we're at adoption or later? Okay. Who thinks we're at growth or later? And who's just falling asleep with their hands up? <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, so I put it at adoption. And, and I kind of tried to find analogies between what I was finding in, on the internet side and the LP side. And again, I, I totally grant it if someone says that I'm a little bit too optimistic here, but um, I think there was sort of the concept stage when we were ex just experimenting at Ripple Research like many years ago. Um, the first prototype that I can point to was what we then called Five Bells. Um, and keep in mind that it's actually funny because packets or penny switching kind of came into the process pretty late. So, you know, again, tough to line these things up perfectly. But um, ILPv4, I think, is a, was a pretty big milestone on the specification side. And, and actually, it's surprising how fast we got from that to stream. Um, whereas, like, um, on the internet side, like, TCP was technically specified before IPv4. But um, it, there was definitely, like, TCP was a big thing. And there was a huge project to get to that. Um, but I think that's because we were able to copy from, from prior art. Um, and then for me, the launch is when we released Codius because that's when we went from, oh, the network is down, who cares, um, to, oh, the network is down, go fix it fast, you know? And, and that was kind of to prepare for the launch of our own product. And the reason we did it this way, where we released Codius first and then uh, Coil launched, so Codius launched in, in June, and then a coil launched in September. Um, the reason we did it that way, that way was because we didn't want to have our brand immediately ruined because it wasn't working. Um, and so uh, we decided to launch this open source thing first and try to get the Intelligent Network to work okay. And um, if Codius wasn't working, that might have been okay, but we definitely wanted Intelligent to work and, and not break. And so um, I feel like last year, and, and again, you can put it in June or you can put it in September, but at um, some point last year, there was a permanent live IntelliJ network, and that network has continued to exist and continued to work to today. And I am very confident that it is up right now um, because I don't see those guys running around screaming <laughs> and um, trying to fix it. Um, and then, uh, so why, would I, why did I put adoption? Well, um, I think it's some of the most recent presentations that we saw today, the fact that they're the first fiat connections and these are not hobbyists. These are not people running connectors for fun. Uh, these are companies that want to make a buck by adopting IntelliJ. And to me, that's a pretty powerful thing to say. That's, that's you know, you are putting your own money on the line. Some, some investor somewhere is on the hook. And, and it's not just Ripple. <laughs> there are other, <laughs> other people's money on the line, too. Um, and I think, I think we are definitely sort of just starting with the adoption phase. Um, and that kind of puts growth in, in the, the future. And um, certainly, I hope that we will make significant progress on growth in the next decade. Um, and I think it will take a long time for maturity. I don't think that we'll necessarily reach that much faster than the internet did, because it's a similar level of things that have to upgrade and change. So anyway, so that's just my guess. And uh, yeah, if you want to stay in touch, you can find all of my social stuff on adjustment.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at JustMoon. And if you want to work at Coil, please just email curious at coil.com. Thank you. And the introvert in me wanted to just run away, but I suppose I'll take some questions. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, um, what kind of resources do we need in the community, um, presumably to kind of make IntelliJ successful? Great question. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's people that are willing to go beyond making this a hobby to making this a job. Um, and I, that, again, like every professional starts as a hobbyist. So that's not to say that if you're just sort of tangentially interested, you shouldn't play around with it and not commit too much. Um, but I think the, the moment when uh, this moves forward is when more people say like, okay, our company, we're going to do 100% IntelliJ. Or like, our product is going to be 100% running on IntelliJ. And, you know, I'm trying to lead by example. Coil does not pay out any other way. 
and we have no plans to ever pay out any other way. And we are kind of like either going to succeed or fail together with the rest of the IntelliJ ecosystem. And you know, there, there are a few other people that are making that jump, uh, Cinnamon, uh, Puma, um, and we need more of that. Adrian. Um, a question you can totally just say, I don't think we should talk about it. Um, <laughs> oh <boy. laughs> um, do you think, I, I think the one major difference between Interledger and the internet is obviously the regulatory stuff. Um, do you have a vision of how we get to that, like Interledger is ubiquitous uh, future, uh, given the way regulations are today, or do you think they will change? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so the question is, um, you know, how do we uh, get to where we want to be given regulation and how do we address regulatory concerns? I would say that regulation is not that different from other challenges for any new business. Um, I think that it, it matters what your, uh, what your relationship to regulators is, it matters what your approach is, it matters what your reputation is. Um, and so I would say that, that if we can get good qualified people, and that can be either the entrepreneur themselves that starts the company can have a sense of regulatory, um, of a good re regulatory approach, or maybe they hire somebody that does that, or maybe one of their investors can give them advice. Um, I don't think there's sort of a blanket answer that we can give for Interledger as a whole. Um, I think it's like each business has to figure out how to operate what they are doing in their jurisdiction and do that successfully. Um, and also, I hope I'm, I've just avoided the trap that you set. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I think it's, 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 to me, it's another resource question. Like, how do we attract awesome people, smart people, experienced people um, that can help navigate some of those things and make their respective companies successful in navigating those things? What is your advice to the, like the base layer or base ledger kind of teams that are that are looking at? Obviously, we spent a lot of time on XRP ledger, like making it optimal for, for ILP, and I think that's a big reason why it works so well. But like, what is your you know advice to the, the core developers across all these other, including just standard ledgers? Great question. Um, so the question is, what is my advice to the developers of, of base ledgers or so settlement ledgers? Um, and you know, having worked on two, a uh, Bitcoin and, and XRP ledger, I would say that um, I've definitely thought about that uh, problem a bunch. Um, I don't know if my answer is particularly interesting, um, but after going down a lot of dead ends, um, I think we, we tr for a long time, we tried to, to come up with the killer feature, the, the ultimate feature that would sort of make this the best, make XRP ledger, for example, the best ledger for Interledger. And um, I don't know if we found that. I think payment channels is probably the closest thing um, where they actually have sort of a meaningful impact. Uh, but it comes at a large complexity trade-off. And so and sometimes in production, we actually decided not to use payment channels because there was enough trust. And so then you know, clearly that's not a make or break feature if you don't always need to use it. Um, so I don't know if there's like one particular feature, but definitely lower fees helps, um, lower latency helps. Um, I think you know, if you start with XRP Ledger as a starting point, I think the biggest thing that people bring up as a stumbling block is the cost to create accounts and the cost to create um, channels. Um, so I think driving those costs down. Um, and for other ledgers like Ethereum, for example, just block confirmation time would be probably the biggest and fees. Um, so I, I think it's just ultimately a, um, a fact factor of um, the liquidity of the token, the latency to confirm transactions, and um, the fees um, that you ultimately look at when you when you evaluate a base ledger. It's, um, and again, like this, this is not a perfect answer. Like that's that's just, you know, what I, what I, what I think right now. Uh, if you put yourself in the year 2032, and Interledger is powering most commerce, do you have any thoughts for what the topology of the Interledger will look like? Mm, great question. The question is, um, in the year 2032. Um, and Interledger is, uh, is powering most commerce. What does the Interledger topology look like? What does the connector topology look like? Um, I think that um, there's tons of research into what's called scale-free networks, which is sort of like uh, networks where people who join a network have a preference to attach themselves to highly connected nodes. I think Interledger is one of those networks. And so I expect a, um, a topology where there are some nodes that, that have lots and lots of connections or at least uh, serve a lot of traffic going through them. 
um, and then many, many nodes that are more peripheral. Um, I think that is probably, it's not the most efficient, but it's a fairly efficient uh, topology, um, and it's one that, that tends to arise from, you know, you have a freely um, uh, operating network where people can join and connect to whoever they want voluntarily, um, and I think also that, that affords you some, um, like some reasonably efficient governance. Um, I think one of the things that is very impressive about the internet is that um, it hasn't like totally devolved because it's actually a fairly anarchic system if you look at it. And um, there's a really great talk by Caleb James Delisle on the governance of the internet uh, where he basically talks about um, how certain things that people think are pr worth protecting like free speech are able to operate despite adversity on the internet. And then other things that people who are part of the internet community agree is bad things like spam manages to get shut down after a while. And uh, really good talk. I forget what the name of the talk is, but if you just Google Caleb James Delisle Internet Governance, you probably find it. From a geographic perspective, uh, do you feel like we might see adoption in certain areas come first? For example, like Japan, South Korea seem to be pretty active in the crypto world, and then US seems to be pretty efficient as far as credit card usage and others. Like, what are your thoughts on US versus Europe versus Asia as far as uh, adoption for each religion? So the question is, where does adoption play out geographically first? Like, what are some of the first countries that will adopt it? Um, I have no idea. I would say um, that might be driven a lot by what use cases are early. Um, so for example, you know, Coil is going to do a lot of English-speaking content. And so I would imagine that English-speaking content creators would be more attracted to that, and English-speaking content consumers would be more attracted to that. And to whatever extent Coil is a significant por portion of the network, that would drive more um, adoption in English-speaking countries. That being said, you know, someone could tomorrow could launch a, a company in Japan that's just become super popular in Asia and totally out, outpaces Coil's growth. And so uh, I have no idea what, what, what will happen, but I think it'll be driven by the companies or, or by the use cases, whether they're companies or networks. Cool. All, right. All right. Thanks once again.